So I'd like now to um, uh, call on stage Dr. Helen Fisher, if you're ready, Helen. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, Helen, is, uh, is, it's very, very special for me to have you here because, welcome, Helen, because um, Helen actually gave us the idea of a theme of love uh, by when I listened to, uh, to, to Helen in, in uh, TED a few years ago and in Davos, and I was thrilled, and I could not believe that Helen would actually you know, make it here, so I'm so happy you joined us. So Helen is a biological anthropologist. She's a research professor. And uh, um, Helen uh, is seen as, you know, the expert in uh, not only in the U.S. but uh, around the world about how people fall in love. And her books, I just give you the titles: Why We Love, The First Sex, Anatomy of Love, and The Sex Contract. And I've read a few of them, and I really advise you to uh, to read them. It's uh, very, very scientific, as you will see, and I should just, you know, escape now and give you the stage. But um, I think it's, uh, it's, we are really uh, very, very um, lucky to have you here. So, Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Please help me welcome Helen. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me, Louis and Geraldine. And thank you for coming, and I am delighted to be here. I and my colleagues have put um, 37 people who are madly in love into a functional MRI brain scanner. Um, 15 of them uh, were happily in love. They had just fallen in love within the last seven months. Uh, 15 of them had just been rejected in love. And uh, the last uh, 17 had been um, reported that they were still in love after uh, an average of 21 years of marriage. We just actually uh, announced that study at the Society for Neuroscience uh, in um, Washington, D.C. Uh, the world thinks that you cannot remain in love long term, and uh, we've proven that that's um, that's not true. You can fall in love long term if you pick the right person. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about is what happens in the brain when you fall in love, uh, the evolution of love, and why you fall in love with one person rather than another. That's my most recent research. Um, uh, Match.com, the internet dating site, came to me um, four years ago and asked me, why do you fall in love with one person rather than another? And I said, I don't know. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, um, and uh, they said, well, would you like to start a new dating site for us? And I said, I don't know if you've got the right person. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I study why we're all alike. And uh, you're asking me why we are all different. So anyway, I said, uh, do you think you've got the right person? And they said they thought they did. And so I uh, have embarked on my newest research, which is why you fall in love with one person rather than another. So this is the story, the short story of love. In the jungles of Guatemala, there stands a temple. It is built by the grandest sun king of the grandest city-state, Tikal, of the grandest civilization of the Americas, the Maya. It was built by a man called Casa Canchao. He stood over six feet tall, he lived into his 80s, and he was buried beneath this temple in around the year 720 AD. And Mayan inscriptions say that he was madly in love with his wife. She was a woman who died young, and so he built a temple in her honor. And every spring and every autumn, exactly at the equinox, the sun rises behind his temple and perfectly casts his shadow over her temple. And as the sun sets behind her temple in the afternoon, it perfectly bathes his temple in her shadow. And today, some 1,300 years later, these two lovers still touch. Around the world, people love. They sing for love. They dance for love. They compose poems and stories and novels about love. They retell myths and legends about love. They have love charms, love magic, love potions. They pine for love. They live for love. They kill for love. 
and they die for love. In fact, anthropologists have found evidence of romantic love in every single society that they've looked for it, in 170 societies in all. And in fact, um, I did one study, um, a questionnaire study of 800 um, Americans and Japanese to see uh, whether they were expressed the same degree of love they do. Uh, men express just as much love as women do. In fact, men fall in love faster than women do because they're so visually oriented. Um, uh, men are much more likely to kill themselves when a relationship is over uh, than women are. Women are more hard-headed in terms of love, not much, um, but somewhat more hard-headed than, than men are. And um, the information about love goes back for, I don't know, uh, the oldest love poem comes from 4,000 years ago uh, in um, ancient Sumeria. So around the world, people love. Shakespeare once said, what tis to love? I think that mankind has been wondering this since our ancestors sat around their campfires or lay and watched the stars over a million years ago. I think that we evolved actually because love means so many different things to so many different people, I have come to believe that we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for loving. One is lust, uh, the craving for sexual gratification associated with testosterone in both men and women. Uh, Pablo Neruda called it an eternal thirst or an infinite ache. W.H. Uh, Auden called it an intolerable neural itch. That's what happens, you suddenly feel this craving for sexual gratification. It uh, can often have no object. You, uh, you can feel it for a range of people. The second brain system is romantic love, the one I'm gonna talk more about. It's passionate love, obsessive love, being in love, infatuation. I think it's all the same thing. Associated with different brain chemicals, I'm gonna maintain it's associated with dopamine and norepinephrine. I think these are the, also the same brain chemicals that uh, most of you are uh, feeling when you are being entrepreneurs and uh, being driven to the desk in the middle of the night, obsessed with your work, as Loic said. Um, and the third brain system is attachment, that sense of calm and security that you can feel for a long-term partner. Um, I think that these three brain systems evolve for different reasons. I think the sex drive evolved to get you out there looking for a whole range of partners. I think romantic love evolved to enable you to focus your mating energy on just one person at a time. And I think that attachment, the third brain chemical, evolved so that you can tolerate this human being um, at least long enough uh, to raise your babies as a team. And of the three, um, these, these three brain systems uh, interact with each other. For example, when you fall madly in love with somebody, uh, elevated activity of dopamine in the brain drives up testosterone in the brain, and suddenly a person who three weeks ago they were just a, another person at the gym, uh, another person in your social circle or at work, suddenly every single thing about them becomes sexually attractive. And the reason is because as you fall deeply in love with somebody, it's driving up dopamine in the brain, and dopamine uh, triggers the testosterone system. They've got a positive correlation between these two brain systems, and suddenly they become very sexually attractive to you, which of course is the point of romantic love uh, to start the whole mating process. But can you fall in love with somebody after having casual sex with them? Well, no, not always. Uh, most liberated adults have copulated with somebody who they had uh, uh, never fell in love with. As a matter of fact, um, we now know that um, a, a lot of these hookups, these one-night stands, uh, people will go off to try to sleep with somebody in order to trigger this brain system uh, for romantic love, and it doesn't always happen. Nevertheless, it certainly can happen, and the reason is that any kind of genital stimulation drives up dopamine in the brain, and dopamine will trigger feelings of romantic love. Um, not only does having sex with somebody sometimes trigger romantic love, but it can also trigger deep feelings of attachment to somebody, because with orgasm, there's a real flood of oxytocin and vasopressin, the chemicals associated with attachment. So 
One of the things I say to people is, I don't care who sleeps with who, but I'm not a moralist, but um, uh, I do recommend that if you um, don't copulate with somebody who you don't want to fall in love with, because indeed it can happen in the brain. You can feel deep attachment or mad romantic love for somebody who you had no intention of falling in love with, simply because these three brain systems are interconnected. They're not always connected, though. As a matter of fact, um, they can operate very independently. You can feel deep attachment to one person while you feel intense romantic love for somebody else, while you feel the sex drive for a whole range of people. In fact, we're capable of loving more than one person at a time. In fact, you can lie in bed at night and um, swing from feelings of deep attachment for one person to feelings of wild infatuation for somebody else. Uh, there's a committee meeting going on in your head as you swing from one brain system to another. Plato once said, when the mind is thinking, it's talking to itself. You couldn't do this if indeed these three brain systems weren't sometimes um, connected and interconnected and, and, and less connected. So I've hypothesized that we evolved these three brain systems to be connected with each other so that we could be driven to go out and search for sex, fall in love, form a pair bond, and rear our children as a team. And that these three brain systems became somewhat unconnected from each other so that millions of years ago, our ancestors could form a pair bond with one individual and also have what anthropologists politely call EPCs, or extra pair copulations, with other people. Um, thereby, males would have more um, children with extra lovers, and women would acquire more resources for the children that they got, uh, already have. So, We've evolved, I think, what I call a dual reproductive strategy, a tremendous drive to pair up and rear our children as a team, a restlessness in long relationships, a tendency to adultery and divorce and remarriage. We're not puppets on a string of DNA, of course. Uh, we make decisions in our lives. The whole evolution of the cortex is associated with making decisions, with overriding our biology. I'm just simply saying that we've inherited a human nature of conflicting drives, drives that bring us both great joy and great sorrow. So I want to go through some of the characteristics of romantic love and then on into what we found in the brain, why love is an addiction, and why you fall in love with one person rather than another. The first thing that happens when you fall in love is a person takes on what I call special meaning. As one man said to me, he said, the world had a new center, and that center was Mary Ann. George Bernard Shaw said it differently. He said, love consists of overestimating the differences between one woman and another. And indeed, we do. And then you focus on this person. You can list what you, before I put these people into my MRI machine, I would ask them what they do not like about their sweetheart. And they could tell me what they didn't like about their sweetheart, but then they swept it aside and just focused on what they did like about them. And this person's car in the parking lot is different from every other car. Uh, the computer they work on, the blog that they write, every single thing about this person is different and special. You also feel intense energy uh, when you're madly in love. As one man in the South Seas said, I, I felt like jumping in the sky. You can walk all night, uh, talk till dawn. Um, a tremendous euphoria uh, when things are going well. Uh, very much like the experience of cocaine. As a matter of fact, in the brain, we found activity in exactly the same brain region that becomes active when you feel the rush of cocaine. The real difference, many differences between cocaine and romantic love, the, the, one of the big ones is that cocaine wears off. Uh, romantic love uh, can last for months or years. Real mood swings into uh, despair when things are going poorly. Um, intense uh, bodily reactions. Uh, we call it the sweaty palm syndrome. That's probably norepinephrine. The pounding heart, the sweaty palms, the dry mouth. 
it's sort of a bad deal, you know, uh, the very moment you want to be, you're most wonderful. Uh, you are around somebody that you uh, want to impress and fall in love with, and, and uh, uh, you're overcome with um, the inability to talk or even walk at times. Um, real emotional dependency on this individual, as um, Walt Whitman said, he said, oh, I would stake all for you, and indeed, you will. Uh, the last question that I asked people before I put them in the machine was, um, would you die for him or her? And they would say yes. They would say yes um, as if I'd asked them to pass the salt. <laughs> they were really, um, these, uh, when you're madly in love, you'll do anything, just about anything uh, to win a person. Um, adversity heightens the attraction. As the Roman poet said, he said, uh, the less my hope, the hotter my love. The more the person uh, doesn't call back, doesn't email, doesn't respond, the more you like them. We now understand what's going on in the brain. Um, uh, it's called um, uh, separation anxiety and a term I called frustration attraction. You become extremely sexually possessive of the person. In science, it's called mate guarding. Uh, in fact, I would guess that um, the vast majority of all of our worldwide crimes of passion, uh, homicide, uh, suicide, uh, clinical depression, uh, stalking, uh, comes from this primal uh, craving to possess uh, the person that you're in love with. You know, if you're just casually sleeping with somebody, you don't really care if they are uh, sleeping with somebody else, but you become very sexually possessive uh, when you are in love. But the three main characteristics of romantic love are craving for emotional union. First of all, you know, you, you can, um, <clears throat> you wanna sleep with the person that you're in love with, <clears throat> but what you really want them to do is to call, to write, to invite you out, um, to, uh, to love you back. Uh, you're highly motivated to win this person. What people around the world will do in order to win romantic love is staggering. And the most important characteristic of romantic love is obsessive thinking. The first question I would ask people before I put them in the machine is, uh, how long have you been in love? It had to be short. These machines are very expensive. Uh, it's very time consuming to put someone in the machine. I wanted to catch them in our first experiment when they were just falling in love. But the most important questions that I ask always is what percentage of the day and night do you think about your sweetheart? Uh, because um, when it is an obsession, there's somebody camping out in your head. And last but not least, romantic love is involuntary. As Stendhal once said, he said, um, love is like a fever. It comes and goes quite independently of the will. And indeed, it does. So we started putting people into the MRI machine. Uh, this is a, a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. Of course, you can't get two people in an MRI, but um, at the same time. Uh, nevertheless, um, what happens in the machine, and I put myself in three times before I put anybody else in, what happens in the machine is they look at a photograph of their sweetheart for 30 seconds, and they look at a neutral photograph uh, for 30 seconds, and we scan the brain while they're looking at their sweetheart, feeling that rush, and also while they're looking at a neutral photograph that calls forth no positive or negative feelings. The problem with that design is that be between, when you're really madly in love with somebody, you can't stop thinking about them. And so what we did is we put between the positive and the neutral uh, a distraction task. And what the task was is we would cast a large number on the screen, like 4,821, and they would have to look at that number for 30 seconds and just in their minds count backwards in increments of seven. And indeed, the finest uh, techies in the world uh, have trouble doing that. Uh, and it drives all the blood to a tiny little part of the parietal uh, lobe, um, cleanses the mind for perhaps only a few seconds, and we can capture the brain in a neutral state. So it's positive, count back, neutral, count back, positive, count back, neutral, count back, 
uh, six times as 12 minutes, and that way we were able to capture on film, on, on, on these scans, the brain in love. What you do is you put the positive and the neutral together, all those scans, you cancel out what they've got in common, and you've got the brain in love. And we found activity in many brain regions, but uh, perhaps most important, a tiny little factory near the base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And this is the brain's area. Uh, we found activity in some cells called the A10 cells. They're exactly the same cells that become active when you feel the rush of cocaine. And these brain cells make dopamine, a natural stimulant in the brain, and spray this stimulant to many brain regions. Here are some of our scans. We also found activity in the caudate nucleus. This is about the size of a medium-sized shrimp on either side of your head. And it receives 80% of the dopamine. And both of these brain regions are part of the, brain, the brain's reward system. The brain system for wanting, for motivation, for goal-oriented behavior, for elation and ecstasy uh, and obsession the brain's reward system. And indeed, I, it, 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 I began to realize that what romantic love is, I'd always thought it was an emotion or even a group of emotions, and certainly there's a lot of emotions involved, but what it basically is, is a drive, a basic mating drive. It has all of the characteristics of a drive. I will say only one thing about the, the characteristics. Uh, you know, is the most interesting here, I think, is uh, the fact that there's no facial expression. You know, you can look at somebody and know whether they're angry or whether they're surprised or whether they're happy. You cannot look at somebody and know whether they're hungry, whether they're thirsty. And in the same way, uh, you can't look at somebody and know whether they're in love. And in fact, of all of that, I think we, I'm trying to bring that word drives actually back into uh, the um, lexicon. Uh, I think we have a lot of drives, uh, certainly ambition is a drive, uh, creativity is a drive, many drives. I think this uh, it, uh, romantic love is down near the very base of our human drives, can be stronger than the will to live. Uh, it's much stronger than the sex drive. You know, if you ask somebody to go to bed with you and they say no thank you, uh, you don't kill yourself or kill somebody else. But around the world, uh, people uh, kill for love. So I think this evolved as an anthropologist. I always have to go through a little bit of evolution in order to, uh, and, and then I'll get on to more about why we fall in love with one person rather than another. Uh, all uh, animals love, I will maintain. It's a basic brain system. Uh, there's not an animal on this planet that'll copulate with anybody. They all have favorites. Uh, too old, too young, too scruffy, too stupid acting, and they won't do it unless they're in a scientific lab in a tiny little shoebox. Bo shoe they will not copulate with anything that comes along. Neither, of course, with human beings. They're attracted to some and not attracted to others. And in fact, um, there's a, if you looked at two uh, gorillas or two beavers or uh, two buffalo uh, when they've started mating, they show all of the characteristics of romantic love. They focus on this individual. Uh, they show intense energy, sleeplessness. They obsessively follow, highly moted, very sexually possessive, and show all of the patting and the licking and the hugging and the snuggling that you would see on a park bench in Paris today. And if you saw these as people rather than animals, you would say that they were in love. Our ancestors, of course, uh, did not uh, pair up to rear their young. 97% of mammals do not pair up to rear their young. Uh, only 3% do. Uh, people are among them. I'm constantly being asked uh, by the press why we're so adulterous, and I really feel like saying that's not the news. The news is that we bother to pair up at all. So just tracing the evolution of this brain system for attachment and romantic love. Our closest relatives, chimpanzees, are a good model for what life could have been like six million years ago. Living in the trees, a uh, female did not a meet, need a mate to help protect her. She carried her baby on her back. She did not need a mate to help her rear her young. And pair bonding, and I think our modern sense of romantic love, had not begun. 
Uh, the trees began to disappear. Our ancestors were forced down to the ground where they have to, had to begin to stand up on two feet instead of four uh, to, to hold their uh, tools and weapons and carry food. And by three and a half million years ago, probably a good deal before that, we began to walk on two feet. And with the beginning of walking and carrying, females began to have to carry their babies in their arms instead of on their backs. I don't see how a female could have carried the equivalent of a 20-pound bowling ball in one arm and sticks and stones in another and protected and provided for herself. And I don't see how a male could have protected a harem of females. And we evolved by three and a half million years ago, and there's a good deal of evidence of this now, the brain circuitry, I think, for basic human attachment and human feelings of romantic love, a trait that we see everywhere around the world at any age. This brain system can be triggered at any age. The youngest person I ever found who was in love was two and a half, and I certainly know people in their 70s and their 80s who are, who are madly in love. So I then wanted to find out um, what happens when you are rejected in love. I find that much more interesting than intense romantic love. When you're rejected in love, that's when you become a menace to society. Uh, when you're happily in love, um, you just get to work a little late, but uh, you certainly are uh, uh, not a menace to the world around you. So I then put um, people, 15 people who had been rejected in love into the brain scanner and found some of the understanding of why we go so crazy when we've been dumped. I found activity in two brain regions associated with intense romantic love and also several areas associated with addiction and craving and attachment. It's a very bad combination for getting to work on time. I came to believe that romantic love is an addiction. It has all of the characteristics of addiction including um, the most important one here, I think, is relapse. Uh, you know, if you've been, uh, um, you've gotten over, somebody's dumped you eight months ago and, and you're doing okay, you're beginning to recover, and you're suddenly driving along in your car and you hear a song that is um, associated with, reminds you of the person that you've been in love with. That craving can come back, the obsession, uh, almost instantly. Romantic love is a drug, is one of the most powerful drugs on earth. And can it last? Uh, this is our third experiment. Uh, and indeed, we found activity in the same brain regions associated with um, uh, intense romantic love and also deep attachment. The one difference between long-term love and short-term love is that we find new brain regions associated with calm and pain suppression. In short, the obsession of intense early stage romantic love is replaced by a new calm. So that, um, having understood something about the brain circuitry of romantic love, I then wanted to find out why you fall in love with one person rather than another. And this started when Match.com, the internet dating site, came to me, as I said, and asked me why it is uh, you fall in love with one person rather than another. And I said, I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, a lot of people maintain that uh, opposites attract. Uh, others maintain that birds of a feather flock together, that similarity is the case. When you walk, look at almost any dating site out there, they will very comfortably say to you, oh yes, it's similarity that attracts, or oh yes, it's complementarity. Nobody knows. What we do know is that we, in terms of similarity, we do tend to fall in love with somebody from the same ethnic background, same socioeconomic background, same religious values, same similar goals, same general level of intelligence, same general level of education, and same general level of good looks. We know that. And in fact, every single dating site uh, on the internet matches by these things. There's no way to measure intelligence. There are dating sites out there that say that you are they do measure by intelligence. There's no way that can be true. Um, we also tend to fall in love with somebody who gives us what we need, uh, with whom we can have the right uh, lifestyle, play the right roles, 
your childhood plays a role in um, who you fall in love with, but nobody knows how uh, or why. Uh, the Freudians have theories. There's a million theories on how your childhood plays a role. They probably all are right under some circumstances. And certainly, timing plays a role. And I think that we evolve as we grow up, emerge, we develop a love map, a, an unconscious list of what we're looking for in a partner. But you can walk into a room where everybody is from your background, your level of intelligence, your general level of good looks, and you don't fall in love with all of them. So I came to think maybe biology also plays a role. There's two parts of personality. There's your character, which is everything you grew up to believe and understand. And there's your temperament, which is all of those characteristics that you have that um, emerge at least in part from your biology. So I read a great deal of genetics. Uh, in fact, probably all of the genetic literature that um, was involved with this. I also uh, take a look at all the drugs people take. Uh, uh, and from accumulating a good deal of data about the brain and about brain circuitry, chemistry, and physiology, I've come to believe that we have four very broad biological types of human beings, scales of human beings associated with different brain chemical systems. I call them the explorer, the builder, the director, and the negotiator. I'm rather sorry I called them that, actually. Had I read my Plato and my Aristotle, my Carl Jung and others, I would have used uh, different terms, uh, terms for these things. Um, uh, Plato called the um, explorer type uh, the artisan. He called the builder type the guardian. It's a better term. Others have called the director type the rational and um, the negotiator the idealist. Whatever you call them, I think they're associated with four very broad uh, brain systems, brain pathways. And there's a lot of other chemicals involved in each one of these pathways, but most of the data is on these four brain systems. So just to go through them, I, I will also say that we're all a combination of all of them. Uh, this happens to be me. Um, I'm largely uh, dopamine and um, estrogen. I would imagine most of the people in this room have a tremendous amount of dopamine in them uh, and also a good deal of uh, testosterone, uh, the director brain system, but I'll, I'll tell you why. This is the explorer. Uh, those who express dopamine, they're novelty seeking, they're risk taking, they can't tolerate boredom. I would guess that most of the people in the room, as I said, have a good deal of the dopamine system, highly energetic, restless spontaneous, impulsive, very optimistic uh, compared to other types, highly sexual. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, people will take drugs like uh, Wellbutrin uh, in order to become more sexual to drive up the dopamine system. They're the most curious of the four types. Um, uh, they've got most, in, they, they're the most creative of the four types. As a matter of fact, if you take L-DOPA, if Parkinson's uh, uh, patients take L-DOPA, very often they will become a good deal more uh, creative. They're autonomous, uh, they're flexible, open-minded, and unconventional. They also have a lot of uh, bad characteristics. Uh, nobody gets out alive. There's always some, some bad parts to uh, other side of the moon uh, of the personality. Um, I think that, um, and so what I did is I created a questionnaire, I forgot to tell you this, uh, to, to measure to what degree you express these four brain systems. And uh, that questionnaire on internationalmatch.com has now, and americanchemistry.com, uh, has now been taken by seven million uh, people. Uh, and um, I, my studies are on 40,000 of them. I think uh, Sarkozy is uh, the explorer type. Uh, when I take a look at the words he uses, the way he moves, uh, what he says, his various activities, these are comments of his directly out of The Economist. He admires, quote, openness, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial verve, dynamism. He's impulsive, risk-taking, uh, hyperactive, and um, very definitely interested in diplomacy, not war. Uh, and uh, his secondary type, I think, is uh, the director. He's direct, he's blunt, he's quick-tempered, 
I'll go into them later. I think Obama is also a um, explorer. His whole um, focus was on change, on new, on energy, on active. Uh, with all that McCain tried to do to, um, to um, adopt exactly the same strategy of change, uh, he couldn't do it with the sort of the genetic vitality um, that Obama had. Obama has other characteristics um, that it displays his uh, biology. He moves with, with a style, the, the, uh, and I've been watching people around here um, moving. Uh, people who express a lot of dopamine uh, are comfortable in their skin. They move with a, with a certain amount of grace and style. He also uh, has a lot of uh, uh, expression in his face. People who are high dopamine have a good deal ex of expression in his face. And you can actually see with some of those conductors, uh, some of them had a great deal more uh, facial expression. And these were probably the high dopamine explorer type. The builder type, um, uh, and actually these are scales, not types. I mean, we're all a combination of all of them. They're cautious. They're cautious, but not fearful. They're calm. This is, you know, when you take Prozac or Paxil, you're driving up serotonin uh, uh, systems in the brain, and this is what makes you so calm. They're social, they're very networking, uh, they know everybody, they're managerial. I would guess that there are far fewer builders in the room, actually, uh, than other types. They're fact-oriented, um, literal, precise, detailed. These are the people that can, can they're good at um, trivia. They don't need to connect a lot of um, their pieces. They can memorize um, phone lists. They can remember your face. They can remember names. It, unconnected. They're not highly theoretical, uh, but they're very factually detailed. They're very persistent. Uh, they're very loyal, very orderly. I think um, Colin Powell is a perfect example of a builder. Uh, they're modest. They follow social norms. Uh, they're traditional, conventional. As a matter of fact, in, in America, um, I was able to study, I can do all kinds of studies on chemistry.com and match.com, and um, the red states um, are full of builders. <laughs> um, I did one questionnaire in which I asked, um, where would you like to live? And the builder type, uh, the guardian type, wants to live in the suburbs, wants to live in the countryside, whereas the uh, high dopamine type uh, wants to live in the cities where the energy is, where the action is. And you can see a state like Ohio in, uh, where the big cities are all high dopamine type and quite liberal, uh, whereas the countryside is, um, is quite conservative. These are the high uh, serotonin types. These people um, seek respectability. They like rules and uh, plans. They respect authority. Uh, you guys don't uh, if you are the high dopamine type. Uh, uh, they do, and we don't understand them. They don't understand us, I think, for biological reasons. We found that um, uh, self-transcendence or religiosity is associated um, with, uh, with specific genes in the serotonin system. Uh, this is why these people who are much, some people are much more religious than others. And one of their fine characteristics is they're very good, and we know the genetics of this, they're very good at figural and numeric creativity. They also can be very stubborn, closed-minded, rigid, uh, moralistic, and controlling. I think a very good example of the finest of the guardian or the builder type is uh, Gordon Brown. He has many of the characteristics of, a, of the builder, and it's not at all surprising to me that he seems to be the world leader at the moment at uh, trying to get us out of this economic uh, crisis because he's got the biology for it. Um, these people are uh, religious, and they're much more religious than other types. One of many studies that I did at Match.com and Chemistry.com. And here we have an example of a builder who's sort of gone off into the, uh, over the deep end. Um, Sarah Palin had a very traditional view of marriage, sex, and the environment, all I think associated with elevated activity in certain genes in the serotonin system. Religious, literal, a uh, literal view of the Bible, um, moralistic, uh, wanted to burn books, 
and less curious. There was one thing in the New York Times, they said um, they've uh, rarely met somebody less curious than George Bush, and they've met her in Sarah Palin. And indeed, I would guess that they have a good deal of the same um, biology. The director uh, or the rational uh, associated with elevated activity in the testosterone system, analytical, logical, direct, decisive, bold, very tough-minded, exacting. I would also suspect that there's a great many people in the room who are uh, high testosterone types. Inventive, focused, very narrow focus, very good at what we call rule-based systems. And that is everything from engineering to mathematics to musical, to understanding the structure of music. Beethoven was probably a, a director, um, as many of these orchestra leaders are, conductors are. Um, also very good at mechanical uh, devices, etc. Emotionally contained. When I was at Davos, I was fascinated to see how many men in the room moved only their mouths uh, while they talked. And um, it's because is that emotional containment is a feelings and needs of others, uh, they're less empathetic, they can be very aloof, workaholics, etc. A good example, I think uh, women uh, can be, um, uh, show a lot of activity in the testosterone system as well as men. And I think Angela Merkel of Germany called the Iron Frau, is a very good example of the um, uh, high testosterone uh, director type. Uh, John McCain is a perfect example. He's got all of the, of the physiological characteristics of the high testosterone type. The, the heavy jaw is uh, built by testosterone. Uh, the heavy brow ridges, the broad forehead, these are all examples of, of high testosterone. I'm not surprised that during his uh, acceptance speech when he was going to run for president, he used the word fight 43 times. Uh, he's blunt, he's direct, he's impatient, he's proud of being not Mr. Congeniality. Uh, these are all, he's a fighter pilot, uh, uh, the, the spatial relations, he's very good at rule-based systems. These are all examples of the, of the high testosterone type. And he had one other characteristic that I totally was fascinated with. This research comes out of the 1930s. It's up, um, most recently written by a guy called John Manning at Harvard. And if you had a lot of testosterone in the womb, uh, it will not only um, change the brain in certain ways, but it will also make your fourth finger longer than your second finger. So as you look at, look at the, if you're gonna do it, look at your hand with your palm towards you. If your fourth finger is longer than your second finger, you had a good deal more testosterone in the womb. If they're the same length, you had more estrogen, and if your pointing finger is longer than you had also more estrogen. And of course, in his uh, speech in which he conceded, he had a beautiful moment when he held his hands up like that. It was on the front page of the New York Times. And as you look at his right hand, you can see a very high testosterone man. I do think that around the world, we had the perception that he was a more warlike individual than uh, Obama, and we intuitively picked up on his biology. Hillary Clinton, I think, is also um, a director. And in fact, um, I've got a lot of material that's embargoed, but I can probably explain why it is she sticks with Bill. Negotiator is the fourth of these four very broad <clears throat> brain systems. The negotiator, they see the big picture, they do what I call web thinking, holistic, synthetic thinking. They're very good at long-term planning. They're very imaginative, the most imaginative of the four types. Very good uh, linguistic skills. I would imagine that there's a lot of bloggers who are a combination of the high dopamine 
which is the um, uh, creativity, curiosity, and the negotiator, men as well as women, because to really write blogs well, you got to have some language skills. Uh, these people also have very fine people skills. They're very good at uh, intuition, what we call theory of mind, empathetic, nurturing, emotionally expressive, introspective, agreeable, and egalitarian. They're also indecisive. They can be very unfocused. They can be very unforgiving, uh, hy hypersensitive. They can stab you in the back. And as I say, none of these four types are, are all perfect. I think Bill Clinton is a perfect example of the negotiator type, uh, very uh, contextual thinking. Um, as he wrote in his book, I, he said, I think it's important to have a synthesizing mind, uh, which he does, as real language skills, he can't stop talking. Uh, his book, indeed, is uh, 963 pages long. Uh, very emotionally expressive. If you happen to have watched uh, while his wife was giving a, a speech uh, at um, the Democratic Convention, he cried uh, almost all the way through uh, her speech. Um, I think that uh, Zapatero of Spain is also a uh, negotiator. And um, I did a lot of studies to see, to validate these um, uh, four types. And one of them was I gave a, did a study of 178,000 men and women on the dating site chemistry.com in America to see what words these people use the most. And indeed, the explorer high dopamine type, uh, the f most word they used most was adventure. Um, the builders use the word family, directors use the word intelligence, and very important to them, and negotiators use the word passion. I do think as you watch people's language, as you watch the way they express themselves, you can know a great deal about the biology. We're all peacocks. We are constantly showing who we are, not only our background and our education, but our genetics. So I think that um, love is something like a funnel. You walk into a room, and the first thing you do is you look at somebody, and they're either in or they're out. Too big, too small, too fat, too short, too thin, too pink, too green, they're out. Then they open their mouth, and their voice will give them away. If they've got the wrong accent, they're out. You very rapidly pick up their goals, uh, um, whether you can fit into their lives, and what I'm trying to add is the second half of this component. It's now thought that more than 50% of who you are is built by your biology. It is that second half of this puzzle that I'm trying to bring uh, to the mating process. And then I took a look at uh, 28,000 uh, Americans to see who from these different four types is attracted to whom. And that is embargoed materials, so I won't tell you about it. My book comes out in, um, it's called Why Him, Why Her. It comes out in, in, in January. But I've begun to understand some of the biological attraction to one person rather than another. So I'll close with this. Women tend to get intimacy from face-to-face -face talking. We swivel until we're looking straight at each other, uh, we do what we call the anchoring gaze, and we talk to each other. And I think that comes from millions of years of holding your baby in front of your face, cajoling it, reprimanding it, educating it with words. Words are intimacy to women. Men tend to get intimacy from side-by-side -side doing. As the man on the right looks at the man on the left, the man on the left will look away. And I think this comes from millions of years of sitting behind a bush on the African grasslands, looking straight ahead into the savannas, trying to hit that buffalo in the head with a rock. The problem comes when we don't understand each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Wow. Do we have, do, do we have any questions for you, for you, Helen? Please raise your hand if you have one. We'll take just two because I know you're, you're getting hungry if you, have, uh, if you have any. Yes, right there. Yes, Helen, you were talking about the role of chemistry when we walk into a room and see somebody. Well, I was wondering what about the role of energy? We talk about it in terms of the spark, the twinkle in the eye. Isn't there perhaps some sort of energy field involved in this as well? 
I'm sure there are. I don't know what they are, and I don't think science has been able to quantify that, but definitely energy. I mean, for example, the explorer type, the a high dopamine type has a huge amount of energy, and you can see it immediately in them. You can see it in this room, you can feel it in this room, whereas the builder type, um, high serotonin type, is very calm. They're laid back. They stand in only one position. As a matter of fact, um, in New York, we threw a party for, for the four types and watched them, and the builders all showed up in, in, in suits and planted themselves and the explorers were, were, were moving around. So as we begin to define these various personalities, and as we create a paradigm for understanding, then we can begin to look at that kind of thing. I would imagine smell has a good deal to do with it, too. So we have another question. Uh, Helen, Bob Rosenshine, Answers.com. Great talk. Will you put your slides up on the uh, site? We can um, do that. We'll I do haven't it. decided. Do you, but do you accept <laughs> we do it? Do you accept we do it, Helen? Do I win? Can we put your slides up? Um, I, generally, I generally say no, so let me think on it. Do you mind? We hope so. We all saw them. <laughs> Thank you. So we have another question here. Uh, just, just talk, we'll activate it. Yes. Here we uh, go. Would it be possible to draw any kind of conclusions from, from your talk um, to web design and Yes. Women talking face to face and men yes. talking side by side. Absolutely. Just, could you just talk a little bit about that? This is it's this, this is very important to me um, because uh, uh, there's a, there's so many ways that we can use this data. Not only by using certain words, by using certain colors. I now know how these different types doodle. I know where they want to live. I know their educational level. I, I know how to appeal um, to the, the four types in, in ways. I, and I just, um, you know, at Davos, um, when I was making a speech, they were, they were, oh, this is a little long to explain. Well, long and short is, if there's ways to design a corporate board, putting different um, percentages of these people on. children. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know, he read my main manuscript and his first response is, I finally understand myself. You can use anthropology and this kind of data to, uh, to reach people. Wait. Uh, I'm wondering if you've interviewed very many gay and lesbian couples and uh, what you've learned from them. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I um, have, um, on chemistry.com, um, I believe that they match exactly the same way that straights do. I, I originally wanted to put uh, gays into the functional MRI and, and study the brain as well as straights. I maintain that this brain system is exactly the same in gays as, as in straights. Who you fall in love with uh, is going to differ if you're gay than straight, but uh, how you feel when you love is going to be exactly the same. This, this is the same. For example, the fear system. So. Trying to find the basic patterns first. Um, but I did do one study of how. Um, how I want to, uh, almost 10 percent in, um, in the United States of chemistry.com are gay. And so I watched how they, who they chose to go out with as opposed to how straights uh, who they chose to go out with, and there was no difference. In other words, um, the explorer type still went out with the explorer type, et cetera, et cetera. So I definitely will study them. And I, my hypothesis is that um, they will be exactly like straights in, these, in many, many ways. I think we'll take the last question. So, okay, one before this one, and then, then we're, we're done. Um, so there's one more here, please. Please. And um, then we break. We could um, go for hours with Helen. Helen, you will be here this afternoon, right? Yes. So you, you can also <laughs> talk to so, Helen uh, directly. I'm Axel Schmiegel. I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur from Germany, and I'm involved in, in a site called Seven Load. Uh, that does a lot of online video. Um, this speech was a, a real revelation because so many things that have gone wrong in startup teams 
or in, in work teams, it's like, duh, oh my god, had I but known this 10 years ago. Uh, is there any tests? Is there any method of hiring that you can um, yes. sort of uh, advise uh, yes. based on your research? Mm -hmm. um, I've created a, um, the questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire is now scientifically reliable. Um, I also have um, 12 validity points. I do hope that um, Linda Avery and I can, can uh, you know, uh, actually study the genetics of it also. Actually, I have, I've started a, 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 a study in which I'm collecting blood saliva and urine. I'm giving 200 people the questionnaire and also taking blood saliva and urine to, to really nail it down, which part of these systems. But there's no question about that I've got a reliable test and uh, an, an accurate test that actually measures these things. And, um, and, and, uh, and down the road, uh, I do hope that we can use it for, for hiring, for understanding our colleagues, for understanding what went wrong, for understanding why you're up in the middle of the night doing, you know, it's, uh, you know obsessively doing your work and why you can't get your colleagues to do it with you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I find it, uh, you know, I've been studying people for 30 years, and I think I finally understand them. Last Thank question, you. please, for Helen. Yeah. Uh, are there boundaries between different kinds of love? Uh, what do you say about a romantic love? Or what, what I feel for other people, my friends, or people I admire, uh, people I, I really like when I read their books or something? I'm not quite sure I understand your question. The boundaries between the differences between the, 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 the kind of love or love, yeah. uh, are they clear? Uh, oh, yes. My brain works a very different way when I'm in love with my wife or when I like a book. Oh, oh when you like a book, I thought you yes. were about to say yes, something. I, You don't stay up all night with it. Uh, you don't get possessive when somebody else uh, borrows it. Uh, y you don't kill your neighbor who steals it. Uh, you know, it's a very distinctly different thing. And what we've really found in mapping the brain is it is arises from different parts of the brain. But let me be clear, the, these brain systems overlap in many ways. This is not a cut and dried systems, but, and in fact, even for your wife, I'm sure there's times you're madly in love with her, and there's times you flat out hate her, and there's times that you, you know, but you always feel attached to her, you know, so that the brain is, it's a soup, and there's ratios between these chemical systems, but um, the brain system for romantic love really is quite distinct. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Helen. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much.